share a lot more ready to go with everyone. All right, good evening, everyone. I'd like to start this meeting by recognizing the area we call the Fraser Valley Regional District has been home to the Naklakma, the Statlium, the Stalo, and the Stahelis peoples for generations. There are 31 communities with reserved lands in the FERD jurisdiction and as many as 69 groups with interests in this area. This diverse landscape means that there are many different viewpoints that need to be considered when we make decisions, because what we decide here as a local government can affect everyone in different ways now and into the future. So as part of our collective responsibility, I commit that we continually examine the work we do to ensure that our projects, plans, initiatives, and discussions are guided by the principles of inclusion, collaboration, and reconciliation today and in the future. With that in mind, I'd like to call to order the May 16th, 2024 meeting of the Fraser Valley Regional District. Ms. Kinnaman, first item, uh, before uh, we start, actually just want to recognize an alternate director. We have uh, alternate director Messier with us tonight. So, uh, <laughs> Ms. Kinnaman. Thank you. Uh, looking for approval of the agenda, addenda, and late items. So moved, Mr. Chairman. It's moved by Director Fascio, second by Director Gibson. All in favor, opposed to any, Adam carries next item. 4.1 is the Fraser Valley Regional District Transit Update. We have a delegation by Rob Ringma. Uh, Mr. Ringma. I thought we had a rule about leaf spans at this table. But... <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. Over to you, Mr. Ringma. Thank you, Chair Lum. Um, to start, you, you kind of took a poke at uh, Mayor Horn, but he actually um, rightfully let me know that He's actually, this meeting is actually saving my marriage tonight because my wife is a huge Oilers fan. So <laughs> by me being here today, even on a playoff game, I'm happy to be here. So um, I'm also joined by, so sorry, introductions. My name is Rob Ringma. For those who I don't know, uh, lots of familiar faces across the room. For those who don't know me, Rob Ringma, I'm the Senior Manager of Government Relations with BC Transit. So my key role is I'm the key liaison between uh, local government and uh, BC Transit. And I'm supported by subject matter experts, uh, one of which is on the line, Erin uh, Sparks. Erin is one of our senior transit planners, and she's responsible for uh, the Fraser Valley. So we work together across the Fraser Valley. Um, and yeah, we're happy to be here today to uh, to walk you through a bit of a transit update. So I think Erin's going to share a presentation. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll get through the presentation. Um, if you don't mind just holding questions till the end, that'd be appreciated just so we can kind of get through uh, through the, the presentation. Uh, next slide, please, Erin. So we always start off these uh, presentations with, uh, of course, agenda, uh, ridership update. I'll talk, uh, Aaron will talk a little bit about transit future action plans, where we are in the process. Um, we're finishing off the FERD transit plan and we're just starting the Central Fraser Valley Transit Plan. We'll talk a little bit about transit improvement and expansions. Um, some of those pieces will include uh, um, our work on the north of Fraser route. Uh, I'll give you a bit of an update on the Chilliwack Transit Facility, and we'll talk a little bit about the Fraser Valley Express, which is uh, which is uh, ha having a great return to ridership, but it is uh, causing us some, uh, some challenges from a capacity perspective. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So a little tough to see, so I'll just give you the Coles notes. This is provincial ridership. Um, basically tracked over the last uh, four years now, from 2019 to 2024, actually, so right up till now. Um, basically, that line that you see that drops down, that's obviously when the COVID uh, pandemic hit. But we've seen successive uh, returns to ridership each year. And actually, uh, in 20, uh, basically, the average for, for the province has been over 100% uh, ridership recovery since uh, about February of this year. So, you know, today's presentation will probably be the last time you'll hear me talk about ridership recovery, because um, most of the systems here in the Fraser Valley have surpassed the pre-pandemic uh, levels of ridership and are seeing really strong growth. And we're seeing that provincially as well. And I'll just note that that is not the pace across many other transit jurisdictions, uh, not only uh, in Canada, but also North America. There's still very uh, a lot of transit agencies that are struggling with uh, with recovery and ridership. Some of those uh, uh, reduced their transit service levels when ridership went down, and that has caused them some some issues. I think here, uh, with the support of local government and the province, we maintained all of our service levels through those pandemic lows, and it uh, definitely is showing some dividends. Uh, next slide, please. So just drilling that down, I'm going to go through each of the different systems. Um, first of all, the Fraser Valley Express. 
Uh, first thing I will say is our um, uh, we use automatic passenger counters on all of our buses. Uh, that uh, technology basically has a laser. When people board the bus, it counts them. Um, back in 2019, not all of our buses on the Fraser Valley Express had that technology, but we've since implemented our next ride program, uh, which includes automatic vehicle locators as well as those automatic passenger counters. Um, but basically, we're seeing a, a very uh, rapid rise and continued sustained ridership on the Fraser Valley Express. So we're well above, uh, technically 200% above 2019 levels. Again, I think that data is a little, a little suspect from 2019, but clearly well above uh, the 2023 uh, levels. So we're seeing continued sustained growth of the Fraser Valley Express. Uh, and I'm going to be happy to talk a little bit about um, some expansion opportunities that we're, we're doing as well. So uh, next slide, please. Common theme here, uh, Abbotsford Mission, that uh, blue line along the top is 2024, green line below that is 2023. I should mention you'll see a gap in the, uh, in the graph that is from the strike of last year in 2023. Um, so on that note, just really happy um, and, you know, happy from, from a ridership perspective to see that riders came back to the transit system after what we know was a, um, a challenging time through that strike period. So I appreciate this board uh, and all the council's support through that, as well as our passengers' support through that. Um, but what you see here is, again, Abbotsford and Mission, Central Fraser Valley system, doing very, very well. And uh, we're seeing uh, increases of about 120 to 140% versus pre-COVID levels. Next slide, please. Uh, for Hope and Agassi Harrison, so Hope is, uh, sorry, the, the lower gray uh, line. The Agassi Harrison route is the yellow line. Um, the two blue arrows, this graph's a little bit different. The blue arrow on your left is kind of 2019 levels. The uh, blue arrow on the right is current uh, kind of 2023 into 2024. So what you'll see is in Agassi Harrison, we basically recovered uh, ridership from a 2019 level. Although you'll notice that both lines stayed fairly consistent. So that maybe lends itself to the fact that uh, those services, uh, although their ridership may be a little bit less, they're still very, very important routes um, because their ridership stayed pretty consistent even through those COVID times. So we know we're providing a pretty valuable service for those communities to be able to access Chilliwack and then obviously onto other communities using the Fraser Valley Express. Uh, sorry, my last comment here is, yeah, hope. It looks like hope still just has a little bit of growth to go, but you see the trajectory is increasing. So I'm assuming uh, sometime in 2024, we should hit those pre-COVID levels. And then finally, uh, Chilliwack also showing strong uh, return to ridership and strong growth versus 2023. So that blue line along the top, uh, Chilliwack is also seeing about uh, 120 to 130 uh, percent. These are weekly numbers. These are boardings by week. We're seeing kind of averaging between 100, 120, 130 uh, percent ridership recovery. So very strong uh, increases in growth in ridership. And as I mentioned, um, moving forward, we're just going to be talking about ridership growth and, and seeing where we can take it from here. Next slide, please. And here I will turn it over to Aaron, and Aaron will speak a little bit about our Transit Future Action Plan. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm just going to confirm people can hear me. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Always good to check. Um, yeah, so just a, a bit of an update on the Chilliwack Fraser Valley Regional District Transit Future Action Plan. Uh, so as you might recall, the Chilliwack portion of this plan was completed and approved back in 2021. And then the Fraser Valley Express portion was also approved in principle that same year. Um, outstanding was the Fraser Valley uh, paratransit section. So those sections are complete and they have been updated. Uh, primarily just to reflect the fact that a few years ago when we rolled out Next Ride, uh, we renumbered all of the routes. So we had to update the plan just to reflect that, uh, you know, the, the Hope route is no longer the 22, it's now the 72, for example. So our next step is, um, part of the reason why we're here today is just to present this plan for uh, for the board's uh, adoption for that final section of the, uh, the paratransit, paratransit section. There we go. Uh, so then moving into the other Transit Future Action Plans, this is the Central Fraser Valley Transit Future Action Plan. This is an update that is ongoing. It's updating the 2018 plan uh, and focuses specifically on local service within Abbotsford and Mission. 
To date, we have formed the project working group, which consists of representatives from BC Transit, uh, our operating partner, TransDev, uh, the cities of Abbotsford and Mission, as well as, of course, the Fraser Valley Regional District. We've held our project kickoff meeting. We've done some key stakeholder engagement, and we started to create uh, draft service proposals. Our next step is to reach out to First Nations communities within the plan area and learn more about how uh, or, or if they would like to be engaged in the strategic planning process. We are planning on launching public engagement for this plan in September of this year, so just uh, a couple months from now, with plan completion expected by the end of 2024. I believe now I will turn it back over to Rob to talk about the Transit Improvement Program. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. So um, just for this board, this is a bit of a recap slide to our, uh, actually two slides here, just to remind uh, the board uh, about our Transit Improvement Program, which is also uh, known as our Expansion Program. So the Transit Improvement Program basically um, starts out with, with us working with staff to prioritize different expansion initiatives for the different regions. And then we map that out over kind of a three year time span. BC Transit costs out those different initiatives, and then we present them to local government for approval. Um, that allows us to proceed with securing funding from the province, so the matching funding from the province. Uh, and those expansion priorities, um, you know, individually, uh, we, use, we use any previously um, approved expansion items that didn't get implemented. We look at the transit future plans, we look at your uh, OCPs and your transportation plans, your active transportation plans. Uh, we look at any of the local initiatives and we really um, try to uh, put together a, a suite of options for local government that are uh, in tune with the needs of the community and what some of our data is telling us in terms of ridership and, uh, and uh, usage. Next slide, please. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so the timeline, just to, so that everyone's clear, again, at the top, you'll see kind of transit future action plan. So that's kind of our planning, uh, visionary type documents. We then move into actual planning. So we're in planning right now and in discussions with staff, which is why this is a, a good meeting for us to come to present at this point, because we're looking to finalize some of those uh, expansion items that we will be bringing back to the board later this summer. So you see that TIPS MOU signed in August, September. So that's when we would come back to the board uh, with a suite of options for uh, for expansion. Those would be fully costed. So you'd understand what the costs are and what the initiatives are. And then upon uh, this board endorsing those uh, those that MOU and those initiatives, then we submit that to the province for funding. And then we wait and we wait for the province to announce their budget. We see what the um, the pros and the cons of the budget are and where we're able to implement expansions. And then we move into implementation for those approved expansions in, uh, in the kind of early spring of the following year. And for the Fraser Valley Regional District, we did have a tips and expansion uh, item for the Fraser Valley Express. It was 2,600 hours with an additional three buses. Um, one of our challenges with the Fraser Valley Express is we need to increase the frequency to help spread out some of that capacity. Um, so this initiative will help us do that. It's slated to be implemented in January 2025, and this was approved for funding uh, through the province and through BC Transit. So we're happy to be able to deploy that. Um, you know, we're currently working right now on the implementation plan. So how we're going to best distribute those those hours. Um, I'll talk to it in another slide, but obviously we do have some um, facility constraints um, and also, you know, Aaron will speak to it a little bit more, but we're really seeing where our capacity issues are is from uh, McCallum to uh, low heat section of the Fraser Valley Express. So we might need to work on just trying to relieve some of that pinch point when we implement this uh, expansion, but very happy to let this board know that that uh, expansion has been approved and we're working with staff right now on uh, implementation plans. And then I'll turn it back over to Aaron to talk a little bit about the north of Fraser. Uh, so this is a proposed extension. It's currently in the 2025-2026 fiscal year of TIPS. Uh, the map on the right-hand side, which hopefully is not too, too small, uh, but it shows the transit connections that would exist for this route uh, after it was implemented. So that dark blue line is the proposed route uh, between Mission and Kent. We had a phase one feasibility study that looked at the demand for transit along the Highway 7 corridor and identified some different service, op service options as well as the associated costs for those different options. 
that study, uh, that phase one study has since been updated with some feedback from the FBRD, as well as some new data that we've since gained access to since, uh, since it was originally written. We're now moving into phase two. And what this phase of the study will really look at is taking a bit of a closer look at how exactly that service will be designed, um, recognizing the resources that we have um, allocated towards this in our expansion planning program. This phase two study will include engagement with the public, it will include engagement with First Nations as well as key stakeholders. In terms of next steps, we'll be connecting with local government staff and councils for their input, and then we'll begin to reach out to First Nations along the Highway 7 corridor. And then after that, we will embark on our public consultation process. I will once again turn it back to Rob. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, um, and, and for this board's uh, knowledge and understanding, our current uh, transit facility at Yale Road is is almost, if not already, uh, fully maxed out in terms of our um, parking space and also getting very close in terms of maintenance. Um, two key criteria for facilities is not only how many buses you can park, but also how many buses you can repair and maintain. So when you run out of maintenance space, it becomes a challenge. Um, so we identified this uh, several years ago. Um, I believe we have an approved uh, a tr facility transit strat uh, strategy for the facility that was approved by this board. Um, but we're happy to uh, to announce that we have uh, acquired a strategic land holding asset. So we have a property that I'll speak to on the next slide on Progress Way. We think it's a great, uh, great property that's going to work very well for transit. So really the next steps, we just recently have um, submitted and had approved um, a transit uh, MOU, a facility master plan uh, MOU. And what that's going to do is identify all of the site improvements that we're going to need to do uh, and help us develop a business case to apply for federal uh, and provincial funding. Uh, then obviously we'll come back to this board with a more detailed budget and timeline on the implementation of that facility and make sure that we have approval from the local government on uh, your portion of the costs. And then we'll obviously um, start to phase that uh, that facility in. And one of the key highlights for that facility is the fact that we will be planning it for uh, full electrification. Um, so we will be looking at battery electric bus at charger capabilities at this facility. So it's just a really great opportunity for us to um, make those you know needed improvements in the transit system as we move forward. Um, our current lease in the Yale Road facility expires in 2027, so we're looking to have all of this master planning work done and budgets approved so that we can move to um, implementation and transition sometime in fiscal 2027, 2028. Next slide, please. So there's the subject facility right there. Um, actually, this facility was used by one of the pipeline companies. So it actually already has a administrative building as well as maintenance bays, which is a huge plus. Um, to be quite honest, we call this property internally the unicorn um, because it really is to, to have a facility where we have space for buses. We already have established maintenance bays. It's, it's gonna actually save a lot of resources in terms of actual construction. What we really need to work on is just making sure that it's transit ready. So that includes things like a bus wash, uh, make sure we have a service island, uh, that's where they clean the buses. Um, as I mentioned, for battery electric bus, installing all the charging equipment, um, and then uh, do any of the necessary paving and security that we need to do. So uh, we're very happy. We think this is a great, uh, great property, well located uh, centrally. And um, if anybody knows about uh, trying to find light industrial space around uh, Fraser Alley, it's a, it's a challenge. So we're really happy that we were able to acquire this property. And now I'll turn it over to Aaron uh, just for the last couple of slides on, uh, again, just going back to the Fraser Valley Express. Thanks. Yeah, so I won't I won't spend too too long on this slide just because I know it's already been, it's been shown, but this is just a uh, ridership chart summarizing the average weekday boardings and recovery by week for the FBX. So as you can see, um, ridership is, is absolutely, absolutely recovered uh, to pre-COVID levels uh, in, in quite a significant way, um, which is, is very positive, but obviously there are some, some challenges that come with this as well. Uh, so we implemented a critical fix back in September of 2023, where we introduced uh, two short-term trips between Logie Sky Train Station and McCullum Park and Ride. So this was based off of analysis that showed, you know, yes, there are capacity challenges kind of across the, the corridor, but specifically between the Burnaby and McCallum portion, that's, that's really where we were seeing the, the biggest strain. 
So those additional trips have helped alleviate some of the capacity issues, but ridership and and public feedback as well have indicated that there are still certainly those those challenges. Um, as mentioned, we have expansion coming in January and twenty January twenty twenty five. So in the interim, we're looking at some cost neutral adjustments to the schedules for September that will hopefully help us continue targeting those those really chronic uh, chronic pain points that we're seeing. So looking a little bit more at, at the data, and again, I apologize if this is super small on your screen. Um, so this chart shows capacity on board the Fraser Valley Express by trip time using fall 2023 data. So I'll walk you through what kind of what this chart is saying and, and what, what all the, the terms mean, and then I'll use an example to really illustrate it. So the first column is the trip time. Uh, the second column is the average boarding. So that's the average number of people who board the bus along the entire route for a given service period. So again, this is weekday, fall 2023, and this is specifically the westbound ridership. Uh, the, the third column, so the one with more green and yellow, is the average maximum load. So that refers to the average maximum number of people on board the bus for all trips operated at that trip time for again, that given service period. So again, fall 2023. And then the column with a lot of red is the maximum of the maximum loads. So that's the maximum number of people on board the bus for all trips operated at that trip time for that given trip, uh, for that given service period. So using the 4.40 a.m. westbound departure, so that's the first departure from, the, from Chilliwack in the morning, using that as an example, we can see that there are an average of 31 boardings for that specific trip with an average maximum of 28 people on board the bus for at least a portion of that trip. But there were also as many as 81 people on board for a portion of that trip. So it really, and, and not all trips have that same kind of um, jump from sort of average maximum to maximum of maximum, but we do see um, some, some quite high capacity, um, quite heavy loads on, on these trips in both directions, of course. Uh, so, as I mentioned, sort of the additional morning and afternoon trips, uh, particularly those short-term trips, are helping to address the capacity issues, but they obviously are still persisting. And we're also starting to see more early morning capacity challenges compared to fall 2022. The majority of the ridership is still between the McCallum and Logie sections, although Better and Luckacuck is also a really key stop uh, for boardings in the westbound direction. And I've highlighted uh, down at the bottom, you see the, the 316 and the 354 trips. Those are the, the short-term trips that were added um, back in the fall. So this is the same, the same data set. So fall 2023 weekday, uh, this time just showing the eastbound travel from Logie back to Chilliwack. Again, um, kind of the same point as before, really. The, the additional trips are helping to address capacity issues, but they are still persisting. Uh, in the eastbound direction, the majority of the travel is between Logie and High Street, uh, but uh, McCallum is a close section, a close second for eastbound alightings, and Luckacuck is also a high volume stop for eastbound alightings. And then again, you can see the short uh, the short turn trips going in the east direction. So we added them at four thirty and five ten. So you can see still still quite heavy loads um, loads being spread out a little bit more. Uh, but still definitely um, causing some challenges for, for passengers. So thank you everyone for the, for um, taking some time to let us present today. Um, as Aaron mentioned, just on the, my final thought on the Fraser Valley Express is, you know, you can see by those loads at certain times in the day, we have standing room only on the number one highway traveling at highway speeds, obviously something that um, from a BC Transit perspective, we know we need to address. Um, so I talked a little bit about transit expansion. So you can expect that this year we'll be working with staff to come back with some proposals for further expansion for that route. So thank you very much for your time. This time we'll take any questions. Great. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Aaron. Um, nice to see you both. Uh, I know we got a couple of questions. I just, well, if well, it's fresh in my mind there. The uh, How much of the... Um, the traffic coming back and forth on the express is alleviating pressure off the 555 from Lohi to Carbolf, which is a TransLink bus. Yep. Yeah. So the 555 Carbolf. So we have um, when we're when we're going uh, westbound, uh, we have a drop off only. When we're going eastbound, we will pick up only um, on that route. But 
as far as I know from just conversations with TransLink, the 555 is still very, very well used. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you have any other comments there, but um, I think we we are we are obviously picking up passengers, but the 555 continues to be a a, a route. I think they even run double deckers on that route. Yeah, I know it, when I see that bus, it's it's usually at capacity, and they, anecdotally, I hear quite a bit. And then I'm not sure I can't I can't do it on the fly with the with those timing points, but where you see that big piece of volume, I don't know along the line if that's Carvolf. Yeah, one, so I can tell you um, anecdotally that sometimes we hit Carvolf and we are full. So we've only picked up at low heat and Carvolf and we're full, um, which is why we had to implement some of those short-term trips just to get, a you know, to try to get those passengers from those areas and, and a, a majority of them are getting off at High Street or Callum. So just trying to determine if I need to send my good friend Brad West a bill for the service at TransLink or not here. Uh, Director Horn. Thank you very much. Um, I'm always so impressed by the way you take Mr. Uh, Mr. Ringma, a whole bunch of diverse information from all over the place. And it shows up here and you and your team do an exceptional job of that. I'm exceptionally excited to see the 701 in this slideshow as a present thing. I'm going to call it, if we had the Fraser LA Express, we're going to call this the North Fraser Flyer from now on. So I, I, I think that should be its name. Um, I just want to emphasize something that I've said to you, but I want to have it on the record that from my perspective, as much as we at Mission are very excited about this project, it is critical that part of that project, and I'll be careful in my wording here, include some renegotiations in terms of operations. We need to, um, I think there's a fiscal case that will arise out of that, as well as a, a, a quality of service for us in Mission. So that's a really critical point. And I also am excited that you're reaching out to First Nations. I'm, I've done that recently on another matter. And um, as I expect to speak to the three First Nations leaders along that corridor, I'll make sure that uh, I give them a heads up and, um, and try to build some further um, partnership on that, uh, on that route. Thank you very much. If I could, Chair, if I could just follow up on the comment. Um, yeah, thank you, Mayor Horn. Yeah, I think um, we when we did the last Trans Future Action Plan for the Central Fraser Valley, uh, connections to Metro and through uh, the corridor through Maple Ridge you're speaking of, were highlighted as as very important. Um, and I think what uh, what our plan would be, uh, number one, is to get the North of uh, Fraser as as proposed up and running. Um, and then I think definitely through the transit future action plan in um, the Central Fraser Valley, we'll probably get some more feedback and some more opportunities to look at how to um, expand that service. Uh, could be expansion in terms of frequency, could be expansion in terms of continuing on. Um, obviously, we need to speak uh, and have some dialogue with our good friends at TransLink. Um, and we're having those discussions right now. We're starting um, a bit of a project with TransLink in terms of collaboration along the Highway 1 corridor and looking at some of those um, nearby communities just off Highway 1 that are kind of in that in that zone between the two transit agencies and how we can best serve uh, those communities and and, uh, and and obviously all the communities as a whole. So, yeah, I think that work's ongoing, um, but noted uh, on your point on the 701, and we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking in the future. Thank you very much, and, I, and I'm glad to hear that this conversation thinks about both shores of the Fraser because I'm sure my colleagues on the south side are eager to see uh, what comes of those discussions. Appreciate it. All right. I've got uh, a little list here. Director Barkman. Just a question on the Fraser Valley Express as far as the type of buses. Are there any quick fixes as far as uh, accordion buses or to alleviate? And you had mentioned the concern about uh, buses at a max where people are standing. So just wondered what, what kind of options we have. Uh, through the chair, thank you, Director, for your question. Um, yes, I think um, we've been we've been starting to examine um, multiple different possibilities. Um, one of the constraints I would say right now is our current maintenance facility and the types of buses we can actually maintain in that facility. So as we work through the uh, facility master plan, uh, I'm sure we'll look at different opportunities. You know, we know we're going to be bringing in battery electric buses. But are there some opportunities to look at, say, double deckers or uh, even coach style buses for that uh, for that service? Um, 
clearly, uh, and I think you, uh, if, I, if I read between the lines of your, your comments, if we can increase the capacity of the bus, then we don't necessarily need to increase the frequency, although we, we still do, but that would, that would help. Um, so we've been, we've been exploring those. It's challenging. Um, bus procurement timelines right now are, are they've, they've jumped from where we used to be able to procure buses in, in 12 months. They've jumped to 24 plus months now. Um, the supply chain still has not, has not recovered. Um, when I started my presentation, I mentioned how some of the uh, transit agencies in the U.S. and other areas are not recovering, and that's not helping us when it comes to bus uh, manufacturers because when they're busy and happy, then we're busy and happy. So um, long-winded answer to your question, but uh, we are exploring it. I think a new facility might open up some other opportunities for us. Thank you. Just a uh, side question. Uh, we can scoop some buses from... Uh, some cities that are struggling as uh, help us out. I think what we um, what we can our fleet team is always out looking for um, you know buses and bus types that will fulfill the needs of our transit systems. Uh, one of the um, so I think yes I think we can we're always looking for those opportunities. Um, one of the challenges though again is just from an efficiency standpoint is it is it is good not to have too many different types of buses in your in your fleet um, to maintain the efficiencies of your maintenance and also your parts and all those pieces but um you know i know our fleet team is is always looking at all the opportunities in terms of helping improve our capacity director popov thank you chair lumman through the speaker and you know i don't want to be negative nelly here but uh it's been brought to my attention our attention um that um and with all due respect um some of the transient population uh, that is using the transit that um, get on your buses and and do do not pay. Uh, your drivers are are instructed not to pursue payment. Um, is there any strategy? I know it's, it's probably a tough question to answer, but uh, I know there was a there was a lady here in Chilliwack and and she was trying to get to her medical appointment and she couldn't get on the bus because it was full and apparently half full of set people. So I'm just curious if there's any strategy that, that's moving forward with that. Uh, through the chair, thank you, Mayor Palmer, for your question. Um, I guess I'll start with number one, um, it is a findable expense not to pay transit when you get on a tra PC transit bus. Um, number two, um, fare disputes are the number one cause of operator um, injury on uh, public transportation. So, uh, you know, our drivers are their main task is to drive the bus and keep uh, be safe, drive drive safely, and keep the people on the bus uh, safe. So yes, you know, from a from a health and safety perspective, it's challenging for our operators, especially our operators that are passionate about the job that they do, and and the ones that recognize that fair revenue helps to support the transit service uh, that, that we put on the road. So in terms of just um, what kind of our policy and, and procedures are, uh, as I mentioned, um, paying fares is, uh, is, is, is a findable offense. Um, we have a full suite of uh, transit supervisors that drivers uh, can contact at any time if they feel like there is an issue on board bus. Um, we do not have transit police uh, that TransLink has, um, but I know our team is working through a lot of the quote-unquote fare evasion uh, type situations to try to um, um, mitigate against some of those issues. Um, obviously, we've just introduced our new electronic fare payment system through UMO, uh, where people can pay with a reloadable smart card or through their app. We know by making fares um, easier for people to use, more options for people to use, or we'll always still accept cash, that some of those will help as well. But uh, you are correct. It is a it is a challenging problem, one that we're, uh, we're trying to address, while at the same time balancing the, the health and safety of the people on board and, and our drivers. Director Gibson. Oh, thank you, uh, Chair. My uh, question really goes to allocation of uh, resources. I think all of us uh, know our school districts, uh, they know exactly when the pink periods are in the morning and the afternoon and, and the other times are largely uh, quiet as transit is not used uh, in our school district. So my question really goes to how we allocate resources. All of us see buses that are virtually empty for part of the day, and how, how can you and your colleagues allocate resources in the most efficient way, maybe emulating to some extent the school district model where the peaks are acknowledged 
and fund it accordingly. Because I uh, I sometimes worry when I see buses that are empty for part of the day and uh, perhaps not the best use of our resources. So that's really my, it's a general question through you, Chair, uh, but I thought I'd ask it tonight. Uh, through the Chair, thank you, Director, for your question. Um, yeah, this, this question does come up on a fairly regular basis. Um, I would contest your comment about buses being empty during the day. Um, yes, you are correct. Peak ridership times in the morning and afternoon are our highest ridership, but we do have people that require those transit services during the day to get to social appointments, uh, to get their groceries, to do different things throughout the city, um, albeit at lower levels than, than those peak times. Um, I akin this to kind of my own personal um, my own personal situation, I have two boys. I have a minivan. I'd love to have a sports car. Um, but if I have a sports car and a minivan, I'm paying two sets of gas, maintaining two cars, um, also insuring two vehicles. The reality in transit planning is you need to, in order to be the most efficient, you need to actually um, plan for those peak times. Um, and yes, it might mean that the bus is a little bit empty when it's driving through the middle of the day, but you have to build those schedules for those peak times because that's when you need the capacity the most. So, you know, I don't think we have the ability to park the buses during the day, but in terms of allocation of resources, what uh, what Aaron uh, and the planning team really work on is trying to increase the frequency of the buses in those peak times. So more buses on the road more frequently at those peak times and then reduce the frequency during those non-peak times. So we don't we don't necessarily park the buses, but we do, you'll see longer gaps in between the times during the middle of the day when the demand is lower and you'll see tighter frequency uh, during those peak times. So I uh, appreciate the question. Okay, thank you. And it doesn't look like we have any more uh, questions for you. Uh... Rob and Aaron, appreciate your time. Um, I wouldn't be doing my job right if I didn't put in a bit of a plug for uh, uh, improvements to uh, to the city of Chilliwack system as well. Um, we certainly don't begrudge uh, uh, tips allocated against uh, communities in the Fraser Valley. All um, additional expansion in the Fraser Valley is a win for us. But I just note that this year, this the city of Chilliwack uh, is going without on our conventional transit system. We did get some handy dark hours and we appreciate that very much. And I know this doesn't um, lie at your feet necessarily, but just put in the plug uh, that if the province is watching and aware that uh, we have recovered all across the valley and uh, would welcome additional transit uh, improvements. And after a few years of not having any, we'd be able to put them to good use. So. That's, uh, we're always very interested in uh, investing in transit out here. So thank you. And thank you both for your presentations. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, everyone. Much appreciated. Thank Just you. Thank you. Item 5.1 is the draft Fraser Valley Regional District Board meeting minutes of April 25th, 2024. I move, Mr. Chair. It's moved by Director Fascio, seconded by Director Dixon. All in favor, opposed if any item carries, I got so carried away um teasing uh, director horn uh, about uh, his alternate directorship that i didn't recognize uh director Driesen as not being an alternate but being a full director on our board right now so just everybody welcome uh, director Driesen, who is now a full director thank you and welcome uh next item uh, item six is committee minutes for information and matters arising happy to separate any of those items thank you questions on either of these items Let's see any next item. 7.1 is the FDRD Code of Responsible Conduct Policy Update. Thank you. It's moved by Director Horn, seconded by Director Ross. Discussion. Director Horn. Just want to thank staff uh, and uh, HR folks for putting everything that was recommended into the uh, revised policy. I, I think they added immensely. Thank you. Thank you. Director Gibson. Yeah, it looks uh, very good. Uh, very good uh, detail. My question is. Uh, on 11.1 and 11.2, they they seem to contradict each other, and perhaps it's just my way of reading them. Uh, I noticed there's some additional information added in red, but 11.1 and 11.2 seem to contradict each other, and I'd be interested in staff's uh, reaction to my comment. Okay. Uh, you're talking about 11.1 uh, and 11.2 of the actual Code of Conduct policy? 
give us a chance to look at the section. Do you want to read them out, uh, Director Gibson, or explain oh. perhaps further while they're looking for that, how you feel that it's a, they're contradictory? Uh, thank you, Chair. Basically, one says yes and one says no, and uh, maybe it's just my way of reading it. Uh, I'm sure staff had a clarification. Uh, Ms. Van Ness. Thank you. Through the chair to Director Gibson. Um, I think what the policy is saying here is that um, a respondent may make a request. However, in cases where uh, the request for reimbursement is for um, representation to pay um, uh, for any actions against the FERD, those costs would not be covered. However, um, they would be covered as long as uh, there, there are certain um, cases met under 11.2 that they had not previously be, been found to contravene the policy, what they're claiming is reasonable, and they did not engage in dishonest, grossly negligent, or malicious conduct. Does that help clarify that? Well, it's a reasonable explanation, but it, it's the, the wording is somewhat confusing in my view, but I, I don't want to belabor it, so that's fine. I think the explanation is, is relatively clear, but you can see why looking at it, it's not easy to understand. Yeah, and I think uh, maybe Director Horn, this is, these are some of the additions or amendments that uh, Director Horn had brought up. And some of these I recall with uh, some of our discussions that we had at the chair and CAO forum, but uh, recommendations from, um, a pre as a presentation from one of the lawyers who'd worked on these policies. So I think we're incorporating best practices in terms of what uh, legal advice that we've been um, presented with um, in terms of helping protect the organization as a whole. But uh, as with uh, most uh, legal jargon, and uh, Director Gibson, you're much smarter than I am on this stuff. Uh, I I don't under can't claim to understand all of the the legalese in it either. But I know this was something that was brought up. Uh, Director Horn, do you have a comment? Yeah, just thank you. Um, it was raised. I raised when we saw the first draft that uh, we needed to be clear that the ability of a director to defend themselves in a conduct matter didn't extend to the public paying for them to take legal action of their own accord against the, the regional district. Defense versus, defense versus offense is the way I would describe. Ms. Kinnaman. Chair Lum, um, I don't know if this is helpful or if we're just gonna muddy the waters here, but I would just draw the attention to the may language that's used in this, in this clause. So a respondent may make a request. Does it mean that it would be granted uh, and that the board may resolve to reimburse? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, don't see any other comments. Call the question. All in favor, opposed, if any, the item carries. Next item. 8.1 is the 2024 tax requisition results. Okay. Uh, uh, information item. Any questions? Uh, don't see any. Next item. 8.2 is 2023 electoral area annual development cost charge report. Uh, another information item. Any questions? Don't be any. Next item. 8.3 is a call answer levy update. Okay. I have a uh, move by Director Horn, second by Director Popo. Discussion. Director Horn. Very quickly, uh, just to those who weren't at RACS, uh, this came up as you see without a recommendation, but the RACS commentary in summary was we've been talking about this a long time and there'll need to be some mobilization if we're to actively advocate through UPCM. Thank you, I don't see any other comments. I'll call the question, all in favor, opposed if any, come carries, this item. 8.4 is the forced labor report. Thank you, uh, mover and a seconder. It's moved by Director Johnson, second by Director Dixon. Discussion, <laughs> hearing none, all in favor, opposed if any, item carries, this item. 8.5 is financial plan 2024 to 2028 amendment for May. Thank you. Uh, mover in a seconder on this one. It's for all. It's moved by Director Clute, seconded by Director Dreesen. Discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Opposed? If any? Item carries. Next item. 8.6 is a 2024 grant and aid request for the Cultus Lake Fire Department Association and Electoral Area H. Thank you. It's moved by Director Dixon, seconded by Director Johnson. Discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Opposed? If any? Item carries. Next item. 8.7 is a 2024 grant and aid request for the Columbia Valley Fire Department Association and Electoral Area H. Thank you. It's moved by Director Dixon, seconded by Director Castle. Discussion. 
Hearing none, all in favor, opposed, if any, item carries. This item 8.8 .8 is a UBCM Asset Management Planning Program grant application for the Asset Management Strategy. Thank you. It's moved by Director Pranger, seconded by Director Ross. Discussion, uh, Director Reed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a question through maybe to staff the uh, likelihood of gaining the grant and um, what happens if we don't get the grant? Uh, Ms. Kinnaman. Sure, I think I'll just turn this one over to our CFO, uh, Kelly Lonsborough. Ms. Lonsborough. Okay, thank you. Um, through the chair, thank you for the question. Um, I wish I knew the likelihood. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the second part though is uh, we have the funds budgeted. Thank you. Thank you. And if we were successful, this would just offset part of those costs. Yes, correct? that's correct. Do uh, the uh, regional services budget. Excellent. Okay. Um, ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed if any item carries. Next item. 8.9 is UBCM Asset Management Planning Program Grant Application for Sewer Facilities Asset Renewal Profile Project. Thank you. It's moved by Director Clute, seconded by Director Reed. Discussion, Director Dixon. I'm just going to ask the same question because I like that question over there. Um, would it be the same thing that if this was not successful, then the um, the full funds would come out of the um, the choices that are listed in the cost section? Ms. Kenneman or Ms. Lounsborough? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Okay. Uh, ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? If any item carries. Next item. 9.1 is the Fraser Valley Regional District Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number 1716 for the development of a campground at 26793 Dogwood Valley Road in Electoral Area B. Thank you. This is EAs. It's moved by Director Damo, seconded by Director Castle. Discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed to any? Item carries. Next item. 9.2 is the Fraser Valley Regional District Bylaw Offense Notice Enforcement Amendment Bylaw Number 1724. Okay, motion number one is for everyone. It's moved by Director Michael Honick, second by Director Dickey. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed if any item carries. Motion number two is moved by Director. Move Michael number two. Thank second you. by Director Fascio. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed if any item carries. And motion number three, adoption. Moved by Director Castle, second by Director Dixon. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed if any item carries. Next item. 9.3 is the Fraser Valley Regional District Sub-Regional Transit Service Area Amendment Bylaw, number 1729. Thank you. Let's move by Director Pranger, second by Director Gill. Discussion? None. All in favor? Opposed to any item carries. Next item. 10.1 is the BC Wildfire Service Rental Agreement. Thank you. Let's move by Director Johnson, seconded by Director Adamo. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, opposed if any, item carries, next item. 11.1 .1 is the building department update. Question through the building department. See any, next item. 11.2 is fire department's 2023 statistics. Busy years, uh, any uh, questions on this item? Let's, uh, Director Reed, go ahead. Uh, uh, found that a very interesting um, document and but very curious to maybe a gain better understanding on how the firefighters that are on call are doing 20% uh, of their time spending doing medical calls. So they're leaving their jobs to go on a medical call and then going back to their jobs to basically support the BC ambulance service. This seems like a pretty large problem that we're asking our fire departments throughout all of our municipalities and, and regional districts to do this kind of work. And I think we need to do something about that. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Reed. Uh, certainly a challenge not limited to the electoral areas, but everywhere, I think. Uh, but not sure if staff want to more take that as a statement uh, and just nod. I see a lot of nodding in agreement here. Ms. Kinnaman. Uh, yes, uh, Charlam, I guess my instant reaction is just yes, correct. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I would note that um, UBCM, there have been resolutions to this effect in the past. 
I believe this is an item that was taken into consideration as part of the financial um, strategy committee. I'm not sure the exact name of UBCM that has a, a, a list of recommendations for improvements improvements for local government and improving the financial framework. Strong and this is one of those aspects. Futures. Sorry, what fiscal, is it called? Chair? Fiscal futures. Thank you. That. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Director Ross. Yeah, I just wanted to point to mention that this was um, an advocacy days for the Union of BC Municipalities. Every April, we go and lobby the province about the top three issues. And this was identified as one of the top three and um, obviously there are the financial costs to all of our communities, but there's also the human cost to firefighters. And you know what they're seeing now and how so many of them are suffering um, with PTSD because of what they are experiencing on, on a daily basis. So um, we did speak about that quite a bit. Director Castle. Thank you, Chair Lam. Um, I just want to thank Director Reed for, for making that statement. Um, I've I've been dumbfounded for a very long time why this issue has not become a major issue in a, in a provincial election campaign. And I hope that we can all use our voices to elevate this in the in the upcoming campaign. This is not right. Thank you, Dr. Castle. Other um, comments or questions on the information item? Don't see any. Ms. Kenneman. 11.3 is recovery management services for the Kukupi Creek wildfire. Again, an information item. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Director Castle. Thank you, Chair Lum. Um, I just have a question through you to staff. One of the statements in this report that that it doesn't sit well with me, um, our request to extend ESS supports to our impacted constituents be beyond October 17, 2023 was not approved by the province. Um, and, and the report does go in to give a bit of an explanation on that. Um, can, can, can we have staff kind of describe the need and whether the need warrants some sort of advocacy on behalf of those residents? Ms. Kinnaman. Uh, thank you. I think we'll ask Graham Daniluz, our Director of Planning, Development and Emergency Management to weigh in on that one. Thank you. With a nod from the chair, I'll defer to Trina College, who's our manager of emergency management. Ms. College. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, there were multiple levels of authorizations provided for extensions province-wide, essentially built based out on the disaster scope and scale. The uh, eligible extensions were not equitably distributed province-wide, and so some constituents in more urban, high-attention disaster areas received supports differently than those who were in low-attention disaster areas. And typically, extensions were provided to those who were very comfortably placed in commercial accommodations and didn't have a way of leaving those commercial accommodations, whereas those who had their own structure a, a travel trailer, whatnot, friend and family to stay with, didn't have the same equity of access to ESS extensions. Thank you. And and what should we be doing on behalf of those residents? Uh, this college, maybe more of a political advocacy type question, but you can take a stab at it, go ahead. I do think political advocacy would be a, a reasonable approach. I'm, I'm not so sure that we would be able to influence change in that from a staff level. Thank you. And I will just add that I did uh, I did bring this up uh, during the EA advocacy um, meeting this afternoon and was told that uh, it, it, it would be, could be part of the joint advocacy opportunities um, with the CAOs and the chairs of the regional districts. So. Excellent. Uh, next item. The next item is 11.4, which is 2023 wildfire fuel management prescriptions. Questions? Director Fascio. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Three years of staff. Can you just please explain to me a little bit what that uh, means, that fuel uh, management prescriptions? Is that a reduction in the fuel? Is that you're seeking funding for that? This is what we're moving forward in Harrison at the moment with. Sure, perhaps uh, since tr I see that Tarina's here, I apologize for that earlier. Uh, maybe Tarina could answer that question. 
Thank you. Thank you. It does not result in fuel load reduction. Uh, fuel prescriptions are essentially a document that gives guidance on how fuel can be mitigated. A FVRD would have to apply for another grant through another grant funding body to pay private foresters to then go and reduce the load in areas where it's reasonable. We happen to be fortunate in this round where the province was reaching out looking for some projects. We handed the projects off to the provincial government to consider in their long-term forestry practices. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, Director Horn? Well, thank you to Director Fascio for raising that question because I had assumed from reading the report that there was nothing more to be done. And now I'm not so sure. I'm wondering if essentially the handing off these prescriptions just sort of ends up leaving work in a state of abeyance. Um, so through the chair to staff, would it be worthwhile for us to work collaboratively with another party or on our own um, reach out for those same grants? I'm assuming we would have to hand them off as well, but I'm not certain of that. But it certainly makes no sense to me to come up with a prescription or formula and then have it sit there um, gathering dust. Mm, Ms. College. Fantastic commentary. This was a really intriguing project. Uh, when we first applied as an organization in 2018 for a community wildfire protection plan and received that in 2019, there were really large areas recommended for fuel prescriptions. However, as we've gone through the process of having fuel management prescriptions created, the space uh, that was recommended was really narrowed. It, it, the prescriptions that we did receive as a result of this project were not uh, in any areas that had life, population, infrastructure, or development. And so it wouldn't necessarily make sense for FDRD to proceed with a, a small stand of trees down a forest service route or a small stand of trees that's nearby a development project that already has a rather large development application through the FBRD board. And so it made sense with these ones that we would hand them off to another body that wants to consider them. Um, essentially handing these particular ones off doesn't leave us with a, a mitigated risk through additional fire risks specifically to community areas and the electoral areas. Follow up, Mr. Chair, and it's probably a question sort of the way that Director Reed's question was asked earlier. I think my, my observation is here that we've taken resources that could have been used to actually move the needle or maybe move the dead pine needles um, and help people. And we've just done something that looks like busy work. And I'm not gonna ask staff to reflect on that. That's rhetorical, but I'm, I'm deeply concerned about that. And that would just be a public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other comments on this one, Ms. Kinneman? Moving down to 11.5, which is the FVRD Active Transportation Network Plan Phase 3, Round 2 Engagement Summary. Questions? Greg Castle. Uh, thank you, Chair Long. Uh, I can't let uh, this item go on an agenda without speaking about it. Uh, there is a considerable amount of information with regards to consultation and looking at uh, proposed active transportation routes along the dikes um, in Area G. And uh, for any Area G residents who are listening and reading this report, as I did, I've been assured numerous times by staff that there will be no draft proposal until owners of private property where public uh, routes are proposed to go. Um, I've been told those people will be directly consulted before any report is produced that proposes the public uh, enjoy private property. Thank you. Other uh, comments or questions? I don't see any, next item. 11.6 is endorsement of Chilliwack and FBRD Transit Future Action Plan and FBX Service Update. Thank you. Mover and seconder. It's moved by Director Popov, second by Director Reed. Discussion. Seeing none, I uh, just make the quick comment. So I did bring it up that uh, just for the board's um, awareness that uh, unfortunately uh, there were 
more requests this year than than could be fulfilled by BC Transit and the in the monies that they were allocated by the province. So uh, some communities didn't get the expansion that they had hoped for. Um, and I think if we are looking for items that are where we're out there speaking to um, uh, MLAs or prospective MLAs coming up, uh, just reminding them of the importance of uh, transit uh, funding in the Fraser Valley is always a positive thing. So I don't see any other comments. So Director Reed, go ahead. Just want to acknowledge too that I um, believe the gentleman giving the presentation today did mention that there was still some capacity at the transit facility here in Chilliwack, albeit not a lot of uh, capacity, but um, but he did mention that there was still some capacity for expansion. Yeah, and I think um, you know we're we're a pretty solution focused bunch, so um, looking for places to park more buses. I'm sure we can find them. Um, don't see any other comments. Uh, call the question. All in favor? Close if any. Adam Carey, item. 11.7 is Area C Official Community Plan and Associated Neighborhood Plans Process for Bylaw Consideration. Thank you. It's by Director Wardenberg, seconded by Director Davidson. Discussion, Director Wardenberg. Uh, yeah, just uh, want to reach out to staff and um, a big round of applause. And uh, thanks to all your efforts in this. Um, it's been a couple of years and multiple public meetings um, bringing these three projects together and um yeah and i believe that uh, you know nothing's perfect but i think the combined approach with option one is the best way forward with all of the projects for everybody in area c and thanks again for all your efforts thank you uh, director wardenberg Let's see any other comments call the question all in favor close if any item carries next item 11.8 is the 2024 deployment of fire departments for out of region wildfire events Thank you. Uh, we need to move in a second here. It's moved by Director McAhonick, uh, second Director Gibson. Discussion. Director Gibson, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. A lot of information here. It's helpful. Uh, my query is relating to cost. I think we want to be good citizens. We want to support uh, wildfire mitigation in our province. And so there's nothing uh, that we uh, can't agree with. However, under cost, uh, it, it's a little vague to me as to how we're compensated staff aren't time is not paid wear and tear etc how are we compensated and is it comparable to our own level of funding uh, given that we have really limited resources and that these folks from these two fire halls head north to look after a province-wide issue uh, notwithstanding the uh, the importance of that we still want to be compensated fairly so my question is how are we compensated when we go out and uh, participate in these uh, exercises. Skinnerman. Sure, I think we'll ask our uh, Director of Regional Services to comment on that item, please. Ms. Parker. Thank you for the question. The firefighters themselves are uh, compensated based on an agreement with the province and they are uh, paid per hour well in comparison to how much they would get for a call out uh, for the FERD. Um, I believe it's about 35 to $40 an hour that they would get while they're working up there. Um, some of the members of the fire halls uh, do find that attractive and, and would take the time to do that. Um, I believe we also get compensated for, um, uh, we usually get called out in a unit, so we'll get paid uh, for having a truck there and for a certain amount of fire fires to be there. They'll ask for a certain um, a crew uh, to come out. Um, the memo itself is referring to uh, the wear and tear on the truck. For example, sometimes they may ask us to be in areas that typically we would not bring our trucks. It can be difficult to get up certain grades, et cetera. We aren't necessarily compensated for that. If a um, repair is needed right on the spot while we're deployed, we can get that covered. But if we come back home, which has happened before, and then we discover that there is an issue, we have to compensate our, ourselves. So it, it is kind of hard to measure that, but there are there are additional costs that we have to be aware of. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't see any other comments or questions. I'll call the question, all in favor? 
Opposed, if any. Item carries. Next item. 11.9 is Community Emergency Preparedness Fund Evacuation Route Planning Grant 2024 Endorsement Request. Okay. I've moved by the chair. It's moved by Director Fascio, seconded by Director Loop. Discussion. Doing that, all in favor? Opposed, if any. Item carries. Next item. 11.10 is the UBCM Community Excellence Award nomination endorsement. Thank you. It's moved by Director Horn, seconded by Director Pranger. Discussion. Uh, Director Horn. Started out in mission. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions? Well done. All in favor? Opposed, if any. Adam Carey, side on. 11.11 .11 is a motion regarding illegal dumping. Uh, thank you. This came out of racks. Moved by Director Davidson, second by Director Dickey. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed, if any item carries. Next item. 11.12 is the Fraser Valley Regional District Electoral Area Water Conservation Regulation Bylaw. Thank you. We move over to second here. Moved by Director Papa, second by Director. Adamo discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, opposed, if any item carries. Next item. Chair, I would just ask uh, for item 12 if we could move this item to after item 19 in the agenda. Uh, yeah, that's in order. Next item. Item 14 is items for information and correspondence. Okay, questions on either of our correspondence items? Uh, Director Horn. To you, Mr. Chair, to Director Siemens, um, Director Siemens, would it be helpful for this body to write a letter of support um, regarding the uh, flood mitigation measures? Yes, that would be very helpful and much appreciated. Also, consider that a uh, move and seconded. And uh, any uh, further discussion on the item? Don't see any. Call the question. All in favor? Opposed, if any, that carries. And I just uh, would point out, too, if there are other opportunities coming forward at the UBCM, I know that we've uh, we've been happy to stand in support of the, of the city of Abbotsford and some of the challenges. So we would be happy to help. Thank you. And much appreciated. I, we're in this together, but we just felt that now is the time to, to really um, amp up some of the advocacy um, as as time goes on, memories fade, and um, and we don't want to have a repeat, and so we've had a lot of challenges with with getting this moved forward. So we thought before an election is probably a good time to get all parties concentrating on solutions as opposed to uh, trying to fix it after the fact. So thank you for your assistance in this, and uh, we'll work together to protect our lands. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Director Pranger. Um, many of us will be going to FCM and it will be another opportunity to for us to admit, uh, to um, advocate with the federal parties that are at FCM. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Van Ness, did I call the question on this already? But yeah. Yes, I yes, did. You did. Okay, good. Moving, moving too fast here. Okay, next item. Uh, moving to item 16, which is reports by board directors. Thank you. Director Ross, go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to quickly mention I, I missed our April meeting because I was at UBCM Advocacy Day. So I just wanted to report out the, the topics that we discussed. I've already mentioned one um, the effects of our first responders um, in community safety. The other one was infrastructure, and that's due to climate change issues, regulatory standards, and population growth. And the other one was um, housing. I also had a long conversation with uh, Minister Alexis and brought up the issues with about um, food security and, of course, illegal dumping with her as well. So um, if anyone has any more questions, because I know... <laughs> There's there's time issue tonight, so if you have any questions about it, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you, Director Fascio. Uh, oh, sorry, thank you, Chair. I'm just going to repeat what I repeated at the at the RACs. Um, in regards to the LMLGA conference in Whistler, it was a, an outstanding conference. I'd like to thank our past president, 
Director Ross and her committee for an outstanding organized conference, and I have filled out the survey. Uh, there were 235 delegates and uh, there were 59 resolutions, which got through on time, very well organized. It was um, good to see some of the folks I haven't seen for a while, but um, well organized, a great time and very good speakers and sessions. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Leo. Uh, Director Reed. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, last week was Emergency Management Week or Emergency Management Preparedness Week. So I just wanted to put a reminder out to everybody to please make sure that you have emergency plans, that you encourage everybody in your community, especially your businesses, to do emergency planning and prepare for an inevitable season that we have uh, coming up here shortly and uh, to stay safe, but to, to do the work to be prepared. Thank you, Director Reed. Director Horn. I just wanted to update this body on um, the state of the BC housing denial we received on the 92 units of affordable housing admission some time ago and which this body undertook to help advocate for along with other, shall we say, um, common sense measures from BC housing. The news so far has been good that the dialogue is continuing and that they're exploring another funding source uh, thanks to the advocacy of this body, our council, and our local NLAs, we're cautiously optimistic that that project will be able to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Horn. Uh, I don't see any other uh, reports, so next item. Moving to public question period for items relevant to the agenda. We don't have any members of the public joining us here in person, but we'll just turn things over to Jamie Van Ness to check in online. Van Ness. Thank you. Uh, we have no members of the public joining us online, and we have not received any written questions. Okay, item. Chair Lim, the next item is item 18, which is a resolution to close the meeting. And staff would like to request that we add uh, sections 91I, which is receipt of solicitor client privilege, and 92B, which is info with respect to negotiations with the province, in addition to that which is already stated, which was 91K. Thank you. That's moved by Director Fascio, second by Director Pranger. All in favor, opposed if any, item carries. Okay, and just give us a couple of minutes to get the room ready. We're in the first five minutes, just five minutes, 14 seconds of the second period, 2-2. Ian Cole is a state of emergency, okay? He gave away the puck three times in the first period and took a penalty. And it's by the principal that they need. Ian Cole, we need to have a state of, a state of local emergency right now. Okay. Excuse me, yeah. Yeah, that guy, every time he steps on the ice. Consult with member. Chalam, we're ready whenever you are. Okay, I'd like to call the uh, open portion of the meeting back to order, uh, Ms. Kinnaman, next item. Thank you. So uh, we will now deal with item 12, which is motions brought forward from the May 16th, 2024 Electoral Area Advocacy Committee meeting. Uh, and I will just ask staff to put the motion on the screen for the board's consideration. Thank you. Uh, do we have a uh, mover or a seconder to the item? It's moved by uh, Director Davidson and seconded by uh, Director um, McAhonick. Uh, discussion, um, I'll go with uh, Director Ross first. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to propose an amendment that we add, trying to figure out where to put that, um, th that we consult with the 
provincial government, member municipalities, and First Nations, and utilize all tools up and including staring, uh, declaring a state of local emergency. Sure. Yeah. So uh, if I just get some clar clarification. Uh, so is the intention direct staff to, at that point, yes. consult with? Yes. Consult the with? The province of British Columbia? Yes. And member municipal in a just, member municipality. Just a second. Province of British Columbia, member municipalities, and and appropriate First Nations. So remove the word connect and add that. Or and appropriate First Nations. First Nations. Yeah. 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 And and appropriate. And utilize all tools. This after First Nations and utilize all tools up and in including up to and including um, beginning the process to consider declaring a state of local emergency. Okay. Thank you. Does that work? Okay. Um, a second or yeah, a second or on the uh, item seconded. Um, comments or questions, uh, Director Davidson. Um, thank you, Chair. So I appreciate the intent, but um, again, time is of the essence, and we've been there already. So I I don't support the amendment as it is for that reason. I think it just just adds time. And we'll just have us recovering uh, ground we've already covered. Thank you. Okay. Director Horn. Speaking of support of the amendment, I think it's very important for us to have a cohesive mo uh, uh, motion for it this evening. I think that the amendment doesn't take away from the capacity of the original motion, and it recognizes the work that is going on right now by member municipalities and by our MLAs who are putting an extra effort to try and advocate on this issue. I think it's incredibly important, whatever way it's expressed for us to support one another. This is a region wide issue and one that has the potential to threaten wells, uh, natural habitat and agricultural lands and uh, whatever form is, uh, is moved forward this morning. I think it's uh, one that mission strongly supports. Director McElhoney. So um, through the chair on regarding uh, your, your comments, as a, a member of the advocacy committee, I, I really believe that this um, amendment is actually, uh, my interpretation is that it is in, in line with what we what we were, were hoping to achieve and that we already are consulting with the province that, that is happening and, and is happening. It's just put in there. Uh, member municipalities, we're doing that right now and uh, utilizing all tools. I think that we are and, and we're doing that in a collaborative way. And, and, look, and I believe that as you, as you had shared before, that this is, you know, you've looked at everything, we've looked at everything. We have this in other um, uh, electoral areas. I have in my electoral areas. So this is a, a new thing. We've looked at all sorts of strategies. So looking at all, all tools, and then as you look at including um, the uh, declaring a state of local emergency. So for me, um, I really support um, uh, moving this through and, and I, I personally don't see this as, uh, as uh, a diversion from what we really were the intent. It just is, uh, I think, just making it, broadening it a little bit so that people are comfortable. And I would really um, encourage that we try to be um, inclusive so that we can move forward because this is so important to all of our areas and the municipalities because uh, the amount of damage, as you know, and the impacts are, I mean, we can't come back from some of this. So I would just really encourage that and I would fully support this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parkman. Just two things, I guess, um, a clarification on 
what's a local emergency if we've been doing it for, or if this has been an issue for two to three years. And secondly, I don't see any time frame. It like is that open ended? Like, are you uh, you're speaking to the amendment here, uh, right, Director uh, Barkman? So you're 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 hoping. You're well, hoping we've got a whole bunch of things happening now up till October, and so I like to say we're moving into holiday season and a lot of things will be happening between the election holidays and staff time is it worthwhile putting a number or a, a time frame in there to like we say just state of local emergency and i guess that has to be defined that was my comment okay uh thank you uh director bark men uh i think stafford noting the uh the urgency of the matter. And I think they've been uh, privy to the uh, conversation that we're having around here. I feel fairly confident that they understand this. if this is passed tonight, it would be, uh, it'll be a, a priority of this board, uh, urgent priority board. Um, other comments on the amendment? I don't see any, so I'll call the question on the amendment. All in favor, opposed, the motion passes. Uh, on the motion as amended, uh, any other discussion? The motion as amended. Uh, again, I would just uh, take a opportunity. Uh, go ahead, Director Davidson. I just want to thank you all for your support in this matter. It's it's very very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Director Davidson. Um, sorry, Ms. Kinnaman, you have your light on. Do you need? Uh, do you, did you wish to make comment or? Nope, you're good. So I'll just wrap it up. I just say an uh, extremely important uh, issue. Uh, we've talked about this uh, at length. Um, and uh, I expect this is something that uh, that the staff understand is, uh, is of critical importance to the board. And that uh, what you see here hopefully tonight is a unanimity in uh, in support for um, for a strategy to to address this, uh, what we believe is, it, as I said before, if this is an emergency, I'm not sure what is, and uh, I, I just urge everybody to uh, to support this. We'll call the question. All in favor? We'll see if any of the item passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item, Ms. Kinnaman. Looking for a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. By Director Fascio, second by Director Reed. All in favor? Opposed? If any item carried. Still 2-2. Two, two.